He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more. He is risen. Let's stand to honor the Lord. Jesus, we love you for all that you've done. We celebrate you for all that you've done. We say, Lord, invade this house today. Possess all that we do. Thank you, Lord. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood, the blood of Jesus. What can wash away? Jesus. Awesome. 
Release the fullness of your spirit. Shekinah glory come. Shekinah glory come. Release the fullness of your spirit. Shekinah glory come. Shekinah glory come. You move, we want more. You speak. of his resurrection power. And I just believe the Lord's prompting me today that if you, if you need a healing, expect him to move. Expect him to move sovereignly in the midst of our worship because he is the healer. And his resurrection conquers death. Let life flow in his house today, Lord. Life flow in this house. Let 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 life 
flow in this house today. Let the life flow in this house today. Let the life flow in this house today. Let life pray that, pray that. Let life flow in this house today. 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 Yeah. 
want you to think of the biggest obstacle in your life. The biggest, darkest thing. And I want you to see and know resurrection power flowing into it. And my Jesus, my Jesus is a tower of might. Not weak. Not powerless. Oh, Jesus.
healing in this house. There's 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 healing in this house. Healing in this house. There's healing in this house. Healing in this house. There's healing in this house. There's healing in this house. Father God, Lord, right now, I just ask for your justice, for your mercy, for your peace, Lord. God, I ask that right now you would begin to move with your presence in this room, Father God. Lord, there's, there's distractions and there's, there's this and there's that, Father God, Lord. But right now I proclaim that you're greater than those. Lord, right now I proclaim that you are greater than our sin. You're greater than our insecurities. Lord, that you're greater than last night, Father God. Lord, we proclaim right now, Father God. Lord, that you are greater than what our minds are thinking right now, Lord. Lord, I ask that right now, Father God, you would change our mindset from how great is our sin 
to how great our God is. Lord, I ask that you would change our mindset from I can't to I can. Lord, I ask that you would change our mindset, Father God. Lord, to it's too hard to I got Jesus on my side. I got Jesus on my side. Lord, I ask that you would change our mind today, Father God. Lord, change our mindset, Lord. Let us stop looking at the crap, Father God. Let us gaze upon your beauty. Let us gaze upon your grace, Lord, and your joy and your peace, Father God. Lord, I ask for justice today, Lord. And not just for today, but for the rest of the year, Father God. Lord, I ask that today would be the beginning of a revelation, Lord. Today would be the beginning of a revelation that you are risen, Father God, that you've risen today. Lord, that today was the day that you said, you know what? Sin's not going to conquer me. You know what? Today's not the day that death is going to conquer me. Lord, I ask that you would come, Father God. Lord, that you would come with your warrior spirit today, Father God. Lord, that you would come, Lord. You would uplift us from the muck, Father God, from the gray, Lord. Lord, that today we would set our eyes upon you. Lord, that today would be the day, Lord, where we could stand, on, sit in your lap, Father God, and say, today's the day where my sin has been conquered. Today's the day where it is finished. Lord, that we can look upon your grace, Lord. We can look upon your beauty, where we can say, today's the day that I am made new. Lord, let us be walk in the newness of your spirit, Lord. Let us walk in the new of the refreshing of our mind, with the transformation of our mind, Father God. Lord, I ask that today would be the day for new beginnings. Lord, there's so many people who need it, Father God. Lord, there's people getting high down in downtown, Father God. Lord, there's people who need your touch. Lord, let today be the day of new beginnings. Let today be the day where we stand up and we say, now is the time where I pick up the love, I pick up your joy. Today's the day, Father God. And Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you would heal hurts, you would heal wounds. Lord, that you would begin to minister to the brokenhearted, Father God. Lord, where there's hopelessness, Lord, Lord, that you would come and you would minister and you say, no, I'm the hope. God, I just proclaim that right now. God, you're the hope. You are hope. Lord, today's the day where we hope in you. Not in the circumstances, but in you. Thank you, Lord.
is coming again. He says, make ready my bride, make ready my bride, make ready my bride. Oh, make ready my bride, make ready my bride, make ready my bride. Oh, 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 one that has diabetes check your blood when you get home and then check with your doctor because I believe the Lord's healing diabetes today he's calling dead organs to life resurrection power Resurrection power. sovereignty <laughs> ah, Holy Spirit gets on me my tongue gets tight <laughs> you all know the Lord can heal sovereignly without a word of knowledge and I know there's healing power there's resurrection power in the house today and I know the Lord is restoring hope and so there needs to be an opening of the heart just Lord I'm here and I'm ready to receive Lord, I'm not going to block you out. I'm not going to shield you out for fear of disappointment. I'm just going to expect that you are who you are and that you love me and that, and that you'll move because you love me. Because that's who you are. Lord, have mercy on us for not seeing you often for who you are, for who you really are and what you really do. Lord, forgive us for buying into the oppression that comes from our enemy and believing that and then being blind. We don't want to be blind. We want to see. Give us eyes to see Jesus. Matter of fact, Lord, let this be a season. Today, beginning today, let it be a season of revelation. When we see new things and we understand new things, and we believe at deeper levels, Lord God.
You can feel the freedom today. You feel, for many of us, oppression lifting, hopelessness lifting, light coming into dark places. It's a turning point. It's not just any Easter, it's a turning point. It's a turning point. Jesus. Sunday because he is risen but the Lord said that there are many of you here who have lived in a tomb that you've been afraid to come out of that tomb and that the stone that's been rolled over that tomb has been the words of man have been heartache have been disappointment have been death have been so many things but the Lord wants you to know for those of you who are feeling like you're dead and that you're in a tomb, that Jesus says, rise. He's the one that's rolling away your stone. So for many of you today, this will be your Resurrection Sunday. Call me Lord, make me free.
sing that chorus, you're singing a prophetic word, making a declaration. You took me from the pain of hell to drink your spirit's well. I sang your praise and worshipped you, felt your presence too. I saw your light and darkness fled. children are coming in we just need to do one more and exalt the Lord I think we all need to stand together in honor of our King
Jillian. Okay. We'd like you all to sit down, please. Except for where my guitar is. <laughs> Miss Gail will move. First, I want to say thank you to Miss Gail for all she's helped do in this. And thank you to all these beautiful children and all my wonderful teachers and helpers. The kids have been working on this song for quite a while now. May I all have you look at me? You've had time to point at everybody and wave now. Okay, you all need to look at me. I'm going to go and sit down with my guitar, and I'm going to hand you this, and you girls know what to do. Right now, you hold it down here. Do I still bring the microphone up to you? You do. Okay. Sorry, I was confused about what I was doing here. Okay. Oh, my gosh. This is a different Dance on the scribe and the Pharisee. And they would not come and they would not follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came with me and my dance went on. Let's hear it. So dance, dance wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance and he will lead you all. Wherever you may be and I'll lead you all. The dance and he. I danced on the Sabbath and I cured the lamb. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high. They left me there on the cross to die. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all. Wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all on the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday and the sky turned black. It's hard to dance, devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. Yeah. So dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance and he and I'll lead you all. Wherever you may be and I'll lead you all on the dance and they cut me down, but I left up high. I am the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. For I am the Lord of the dance, said he. So dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all on the dance, said he. I think our kids are great. <laughs> and now for herding cats. <laughs> And now for the young ones, other young ones, older young ones. 
Whatever they are. <laughs> this way, this way. Follow, follow, follow. Where do you want to put it?
Hey, hey! All right, while they're cleaning up, if you're here for the first time, I need you to raise your hand real quick because we give our newcomers a gift. So if you're here for the first time, hold your hand in the air, wait for an usher to find you. You don't want to miss out on your gift, okay? So hold that hand in the air. Ushers, are you on it? You getting them? There's a card in this booklet. If you'll fill that out and take it to the information desk in the foyer after the service, we've got a uh, full-length worship CD for you. Don't want to miss that. And uh, some free stuff in the bookstore as well. One over here, guys. Did you get this one right in front of the post? There you go. Anybody else? We're just really glad that you're here, so welcome. You know? Cool. All right. Lord, bless the offering today. <laughs> let, it be, let it be a resurrection offering, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's run announcements. One more reminder that the new Soaking CD is in the bookstore right now. You can pick up your copy, and you're listening to some of the music in the background right now. Please take time to read the bulletin section titled Opportunities to Help. For instance, we need a ride for a woman who can't drive. We need help with meals for people in temporary need, like sick or home from the hospital. We need someone to do the bread pickup ministry and delivery on Sunday mornings and more. So read carefully. Find out where you can serve. A ministry team training will be offered Friday, April 25th into Saturday, April 26th. This is required for any who would minister at the altar, at a conference, or participate in the ministry trip. Some of you longtime ministry team members might want a refresher. A strong and spirit-filled ministry team is vital to the ministry of our church. Sign up in the foyer. Put Friday night, May 16, on your calendars for a marriage enrichment evening with Joe and Stephanie DeMott, with Missionaries to Marriages. If you can provide childcare for this event, it's paid. Check the bulletin. High. People of Prayers, tomorrow, Monday at 7 o'clock, and I can't think of a more critical, crucial time to pray than now. Spirit gives. Check out the core Bible study Saturday at 6 o'clock. The information is in your bulletin. As we know. Check the flyer in your bulletin for the black box talent show <laughs> coming up. It's good stuff. Get all the details. And why did the Easter Bunny cross the road? His friends egged him on. <laughs> all right. While they're bringing up the house lights, I know you guys don't mind going past noon because there's something the Lord was nudging me to do while we were worshiping. A lot of you don't know what happened last week. You do know the story from 10 years ago, and it was 10 years ago. When we were in a prayer meeting, we were going to anoint people with oil, and the Lord told Beth to get a specific bottle. When she got the bottle, it was empty. And she held it up, and she said, Lord, if you want us to anoint from this bottle, you're going to have to fill it. People started jumping up and down because they saw oil fall out of the sky into the bottle and filled up about as much oil as you see right there. Now, this bottle was the one. Beth put it up on a little stand up here on the stage 10 years ago, and it hasn't been touched since. It was bone dry empty. A couple of weeks ago, we had a healing encounter weekend, and Ray, innocently not knowing that it was empty, went and got this bottle and used it, and it had this much oil in it. Last Sunday, I didn't know about this, and I was looking for oil to anoint people last Sunday, and I went back there, and here was the oil in the bottle that's supposed to be bone dry. Nobody put any in. And then Thursday night at our Maundy Thursday service, we wanted to, you know, do an anointing just to bless people. And I took the bottle and anointed my half of the room, Beth took one drop on her finger to anoint the other half, and I thought she'd be coming back for more because she'd use it up. Because when I get my oil on my finger, you know, it's gone in a couple of swipes, you know, and I've got to go back for more. 
Beth never came back for more. And when she came to me when it was over, she had oil glistening, running in rivers down her finger, and it never ran out. And so all of that is to say what, the, what I believe the Lord was nudging me to do is if you're a cancer patient here today and you are ambulatory, I want you, if you're not, I'll come to you, but I just want you to come down and I want to anoint you with this. Not that the oil is magical. You know, I, don't, I don't like to go there, but this is miracle stuff. And so I want to anoint. So if, you, if you're a cancer patient, I want to anoint you. And you can make, yeah, right now. We're just going to take a couple of minutes and do this. Um, yeah. All right. Anybody else? Cancer patients. Cool. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's your own little club. I don't want to belong. <laughs> Nobody, else is welcome. Nobody else welcome in this club. So, yeah, and this isn't real complicated. It's just real simple. So I might need a catcher. <laughs> Somebody come help me. So <laughs> if she'll hold her head still. <laughs> I haven't even touched her yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just in the name of Jesus, receive and be healed. Lord, let your, Lord you're, just, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let the healing flow, Jesus. Let it flow in Jesus' name. I don't want to banish cancer in the name of Jesus. That pernicious, demonic thing, go in the name of Jesus. And, okay. You're kidding me. Okay. Do we just say go in the name of Jesus? Wow. And this one. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. And now we wait for good reports, huh? Yeah. Today's an important word for me. I don't even know if I can get through it. Ah, if you get your Bibles, if you don't, we're cheating today. It's going to be on the screen. That's if Iris is back there to put it up. Where'd she go? Aha. It's on the list. It's on the list. Second to the last. Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country where he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent, him, he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf. Kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. So on the surface of it, this is a story of the father's incredible love. Over the top, ridiculous and extreme. It's about what he's willing to do, how far he's willing to go for the sake of 
of a lost son who has offended him. It's also a story about you and me. It's about how we need to respond when similar situations come to us. See, we're called to be sons and daughters of our Father. That means that we resemble Him. That from the inside out, and from the inside out, we reflect His nature, His character. And so what I want to do today is I want to unpack this parable of the prodigal son. It's really a parable of the prodigal father. It's been misnamed for centuries. The ridiculous, over-the-top love this father had. He did everything the culture of his day would have told him not to do. But in breaking all those rules, he won his lost son. And so there are prodigals and there are fathers. And the prodigals in this, in this house, this house has prodigals. They're young and they're old. Lots of young and some old who once tasted of the goodness of the Lord, once tasted of the love of the Lord, once experienced his kingdom. They became part of the family and we loved them. They were our sons and our daughters. And then for various reasons, they wandered off into darkness and into hurt. And the family feels their absence. The family aches after them. These are people we loved. The fathers are those of us who carry those prodigals in our hearts. We're the people who once gave life to them. We're the people who grieve and agonize, just not, not just because we miss them as sons and daughters, that we love, but because we know what those prodigals are suffering. We know what's happened to them out there. We know what kinds of lives are going on, and we know, we know what they're going to suffer. Because the darkness never works. Never works. The ways of the culture out there lead to emptiness and to destruction, and we weep for their sake. I look back a little bit on my own life. I understood the desperate heart of the father a little bit when I told one of my daughters after she came home at three in the morning from being with a boyfriend that I hated. And I said, if it were 500 years ago and another time and another place, I would hunt him down and I would kill him. And she laughed. And I said, no, you don't understand. I would kill him. And I understood it more deeply when... Nathan had a back surgery and his back, the nerve inflamed and he was in so much pain he was hallucinating, couldn't work for like six weeks. And, and I prayed that if my death would relieve his pain, kill me now. And I meant it, I'd do it. Well, the fathers and the mothers who reflect the heart of Father God have that kind of heart for the prodigals. And then there's the son who stayed home. I didn't read that part of the story. There was a son who stayed home when the prodigal went away. And when the prodigal came back, he objected. He had the religious spirit. He had a problem. What, you're going to restore this kid? I was here all along. Where's my party? That's the religious spirit. That's the people who think they deserve a more privileged position because they've been there all along. They didn't, they didn't wander away, you know. We're not talking about them today. Because there are none of those in this room, are there? <laughs> what we're talking about today is a church with the heart of the prodigal father. That's what we're talking. I'm talking today about generations that need to come together. And I'm desperate for this. I'm talking to an older generation that needs to pick up its weapons and fight... For the younger generation. People who fight for those who know both young prodigals and old prodigals who've fallen away, who've been seduced by the world and they need to come home and they need to heal up and they need to be restored. And I'm speaking today to the prodigals themselves because I figured you'd be here for Easter at least. <laughs> it's my chance. speaking to those today who know young prodigals and old prodigals. I'm speaking to the prodigals themselves 
People that we haven't seen for a long time. People who need to know they have a home that they can come home to. And be restored to fullness in the kingdom. You're part of this family. You never stopped. And so going back to the parable, chapter 15, verse 11, he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. If a man had two sons, then when he died, his inheritance would be divided three ways. The older son would get two portions. The younger son would get one portion. But that should only be given when the father dies. Although it wasn't unheard of for a father to retire early and divide up the inheritance early. So this son made an outrageous request. It was a heartless request. It was, I can't wait till you're dead, Dad. You're an obstacle to me. Get out of my way. But he'd been raised in his father's house. It was a good Jewish home. He'd been loved. He'd been nurtured. He'd been taught the word. He knew right from wrong. And now he made what was actually a cruel and heartless request. One third of everything his father had. Without consideration for the household without any consideration for the effect it would have on his father, on his brother, or the servants, or anyone else. It was as if everything he'd been given in love counted for nothing. Nothing. Now this is where the wars between parents and their kids begin. The hormones are flowing. Confusion reigns. The brain isn't even wired right yet. I've read that research, you know. Why are many teenagers unable to think rationally? Because their brains aren't wired yet. And the hormones are messing everything up. And everything, in that period of time, everything in that kid's heart is crying out for independence. My life is mine, not yours. Too often the parents can't let go, and they keep trying to exert control. And so the kid in response, becomes more and more, just increasingly more and more self-centered and more and more insensitive to anybody else's needs as the kid is pushing away and pushing away. And during that period of time, trust me, parents cease to be people. You are no longer human. You are an obstacle to overcome. And you are the automatic teller machine, and God help you if you don't have any. And then real love gets lost. For a while. The prodigal says to his dad, Give me the money, dad. I'm leaving. You're in my way. And here's the prodigal father who does the hardest thing any parent will ever do. He said, Okay. Okay. One of the greatest blessings any parent can give a child is, I know what you're going to do. I know that you're going to screw it up. I know that you're going to get hurt. I know that it's going to cost me. I bless you to go. Been there, done that. He knows Father knows what it's going to cost his household. He knows what the son's going to do. The incredible extent of his love is you want to go, I'll help you do it. I'll help you do it. You want to pursue a path of destruction? I'll pay for it. I'll release you. I'll pay the bill. Do what you got to do. Verse 13. Not many days later, The younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country where he squandered his estate with loose living. Now understand, he didn't just leave home. He didn't move around the block. He went to a distant country where the culture was different, where the values were different, where non-Jewish influences could lay hold of him and get into his spirit. He joined a foreign culture with different morality and different values, different ways of looking at life. Now listen, you and I are in the middle 
of, of, of a great culture war for the hearts and the lives of a whole generation. It's light versus darkness. Those kids, you're breaking me. <laughs> it's breaking me up when they did that thing because it's what I'm preaching. Light versus darkness. We're talking about the lives of men and women. It's serious. Young and old. Those lives, that's the territory over which this war is being fought. And eternity is at stake. And in this war, there are casualties. There are people that once experienced the goodness and the love of God, but were seduced away as the world's ways invaded their lives as demonic pressure from this godless principality that rules over this culture and its thought and its behavior pressured its way into their lives. And when I say demonic, I mean demonic. These are the prodigals. At this time, or all this time, the father in the story waits at home. He just waits. He waits at home. He's grieving. But what's he doing? I'm filling in blanks. But, I, you know, when you read the story, you know the man's heart. You know what he's doing at home. He's praying desperately. And it's not too hard to extrapolate from the story that he's watching the horizon every day. Every day. Longing for the day when he'll see his son appear on that distant horizon so he can welcome him home. Please, God, bring my son home. But the son's having a good time, at least at first. Because the world's ways are like that. You know, it almost always starts well and then ends badly. Sometimes it ends with damage that's really difficult to repair and sometimes with consequences you live with for the rest of your life. It happens. You know, if getting drunk didn't feel good, you wouldn't do it, would you? Alcohol abuse starts out really well, but it makes promises it can't keep. And in the end, it'll betray you in the end. I mean, it'll, it'll get you hooked, destroy you, destroy your body, your family, and suck the soul out of you. Looking back on my own life, I never laughed so hard as when I took the first hits from a hash pipe in 1971. I mean, that, you know, I wouldn't kid you. It was a good time. Laugh until my sides hurt. And then we couldn't remember what we were laughing about. And then somebody dropped the hash somewhere on the floor, and we got down to look for it, and then we couldn't remember what we were looking for, and that made it even funnier. I still watch Cheech and Chong movies. <laughs> and I laugh because I understand. And my wife, if she comes in and watches any of it, she goes, hubby, that's not funny. Because she was a nerd, you know. what? But I'll tell you something. Just like alcohol, cannabis will start well, and then it'll betray you. It'll make promises it can't keep. It'll damage your brain physically. Don't let anybody lie to you about this drug. People have been ignoring the research for many years. It will damage your brain. There are two young men came through this church that are confined to mental institutions today because they're schizophrenics. Creative young men who started using marijuana on a regular basis when they were teenagers and now they're gone. Get over that deception. Does that make me mad? You bet it makes me mad. And there's no condemnation in it. I love people. And I see what this thing does. It'll suck your soul out of you and leave you cut off from God. It'll leave you empty. It'll leave you bland. Your emotional growth, I'll tell you this, your emotional growth will cease the moment you start using it regularly. Use it for 20 years and you're a child at the age of 40. Emotionally. 
And that doesn't even begin to address the documented physical damage it does that will accumulate over time. And pardon the way I'll put this, but damn our president who stood before this nation and said it's no worse than cigarettes. It's 50 to 70 times more cancer generating than regular cigarettes. Open your eyes. And our state legalized it? Shifting gears. <laughs> you can hold the bitterness in your heart, you know? I mean, you can hold that in your heart, and it's going to feel like power until it destroys your life and your relationships. You know, you can, you can continue to lie about some things. Lies feel like the way to go to protect yourself, don't they? Protect yourself from a consequence. But they sow something that destroys you in the heart of who you are. So this prodigal son, he's having a great time. You know, I could go on with a lot of stuff. Illicit sex, you know, that feels real good, doesn't it? God made sex to feel good, didn't he? God created sex. You engage in it outside of marriage, you're going to be carrying around bits and pieces of a whole lot of people you became one flesh with that you're not designed for. And in the end, you're going to die inside. So this prodigal son, he's out there having a good time. He's sucked in by an ungodly foreign culture, foreign to his upbringing, until sin betrays him, and then he's felt, he, he's left in, empty and broken. He's got nothing. Nothing. And this is where my heart burns. Thousands of prodigals have come through this church. We had a youth revival here. There was a time when the youth group outnumbered the congregation. Kids who tasted. I remember when kids would drive by in the street out front and they'd hear a voice say, go into the church. They'd go into the church. They'd get slain in the spirit and start speaking in tongues. They hadn't even prayed to receive Jesus yet. There were a lot of those. There were a lot of people that came through here who were older who experienced the touch of God, who felt his glory. They were loved on by this family and then got seduced by the darkness of the foreign culture around us as the culture made promises it couldn't keep and had no intention of keeping. And at some point, at some point, like the prodigal son, they're going to come to the end of themselves. They're going to end up empty and bankrupt of spirit. It's going to happen. It has to happen. There is no reward in that place. None. They're living, we get reports all the time. People living devastated lives, they're hurting. And like the prodigal father, we got to pray him home. Watching the horizon with love and longing in our hearts. Instead of focusing on our own crap. Are we ready, like the father in the story, to pray him home? Really? Receive him with open arms, without condition, without condemnation? And I want to tell you something. This is where my prayers are going. I'm tired of praying for stuff to just bless this. I want the sons and daughters of the kingdom restored to the family and healed and moving once more in, in, in the privileges of the kingdom. Amen. That's what I want. Verse 14, <coughs> when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. See, the world's culture cannot produce what it promises. And he began to be impoverished, so he's empty of resources, he's empty of spirit, he has nothing. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into, the, into his fields to feed swine. People, a Jew could fall no farther than that. You don't eat pork, you don't touch pork, you'd be defiled by it. Now he has to go feed pigs in the field. It's as low as he can go. Verse 16, and he would gladly... He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, 
He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. So now he remembers what he'd given up. The insanity that the culture had sowed into him was finally broken. And I mean insanity. One of the things that Jesus knew was that anybody that was cut off from God is alienated from himself or herself. You're cut off from who you really are. When you live by the world's standards and beliefs, you'll never find an identity there. You'll never, in fact, find a belonging there. Because it's not what you're made for. See, there's no more lost place than to be in that kind of darkness. And so one day, you find yourself empty. You find yourself empty with a string of broken relationships behind you, and you don't even know why. You're empty, and you're purposeless, and you can't figure it out. Or you're living in poverty because you spent it all on pot or some other drug while you chose not to get an education, and you tried to take the short road, and it felt good at first, but it sucked the soul right out of you. Now you're empty. And there's no condemnation in it. It's a reality. If you once had a close connection with God, you were once touched by the power and the love, and then you allowed the world to draw you away from that, you've lost yourself. And so much is going to go so wrong. So the parable says he came to his senses. There's an insanity that can come with being young. I've been there. He'd been seduced by an immoral culture. That, that, that led him, that lied to him about life, but it was delusion. It was insanity. He was a Jewish boy. He knew the moral laws. He knew the word. He knew the commandments, but the darkness drew him, and the darkness snared him. People, the lies in this culture are becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, and people are believing them. Christians are believing them. Whole churches are believing those lies. I've told a lot of people over the years, especially young people, I've said, if you dance with the darkness, it will catch you, and you're going to have a hard time digging out. It'll suck you in. But they don't listen very often, and then I have to grieve over the shattered lives and the pain that comes after that. When you're young, like the young man in this story, you feel invincible, don't you? Those bad things, that reaping of destruction, that'll never happen to me, that's other people. But the destruction is cumulative over time. It adds up and there comes a day when you can't fix the damage that you've done. There's nothing left. And you know what? If you start that when you're old, it's worse. It seems like when you're old and you fall away, you know before you do it that it's going to cost you, but you choose to do it anyway, and then you have the brain damage to be surprised when it doesn't work out. Come on. <laughs> well, duh. <laughs> and so what you get here is this, this father waits at home. He's watching the horizon for his son to appear, aching and weeping for the loss of the one he loves and for the damage he knows his son is doing to himself. And so this broken, hurting son recovers his sanity and he makes a decision in brokenness. This is what he does, verse 18. I'll get up and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Now, servants could be regarded almost as a part of the family. But the word you'll use there for hired man, that's the day laborer who can be fired on a moment's notice. He has no status in the family. And so the son says, I've so discredited myself. Just make me one of the hired men. I deserve nothing more because I've dishonored you. I've dishonored everything I've been given. When the world finally betrays you and that brokenness comes, you have a choice. You can blame God because things didn't conform to your demands or you can humble yourself, face reality, and come home saying, God, I have nothing. I deserve nothing. Verse 20, so he got up, came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, here's the picture. You got a picture of this father. He's on the rooftop. The rooftops were flat. Can you see him there every day? When does my son come home? 
Every day he's on the rooftop and he's looking to the horizon. Is my son going to appear? Is he there? Is he coming home? What's happened to my son? Where's my son? And he could see a long way out. And then he sees his son appearing on that horizon and he does what no older man would ever do in that culture. Older men did not run. It was considered undignified. It was beneath the office and the honor of an older man. But now his dignity and his honor don't matter. All that matters is his son has come home. And so he hikes up his robes to run, because you can't run with a robe. No older man would ever show his legs. And so he casts all of his dignity and his honor to the winds, and he runs to meet his son. That's my son. He's come home. He just wants to hold him, kiss him. Verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before the son can ask just to be a hired hand, his father interrupts him, stops him, and he does the unthinkable. And remember, they're still a long way away from the village because he ran out there to meet him. And this kid is emaciated with hunger. He's probably disheveled and dirty. and He's largely naked. He doesn't even have shoes. Verse 22, but the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. This was the robe of honor. What he wanted to do was his son is coming home stripped and shamed, dirty, defiled. He wanted to shield his son from the community seeing his son's shame. Runs to him, covers him up with a robe so nobody will see what his son has done to himself. Nobody, the neighbors won't talk about it. Covers his son's shame. Shoes on his feet. When the prodigals come home, you cover their nakedness. You shield others from seeing their brokenness. There is no shame. Father God covers our nakedness and shame with the robe of the righteousness of Jesus. You getting any inkling what this means to me? See, I know that I bring nothing to the table. I've earned nothing. I deserve nothing. I'm just a prodigal. I'm serious. Just a prodigal who one day trashed everything I'd been given until I damaged my soul. And I came home and Jesus covered me. You want to remember, this is the son that wasted one-third of the family's wealth and now the father... Hope you noticed this. Father gives him the signet ring. In their culture, if you wanted to do business and you wanted to seal a document as being authentic, you dripped a little wax on the contract and you imprinted your signet into it from the signet ring. This son is just back from wasting one-third of the family's wealth, defiling himself, comes back hungry, emaciated, and dirty, and his father not only clothes him with a robe of honor, he gives him authority to do business in the family name. There's no period of testing. No extended time. You have to earn trust once more, son. You broke my trust. There's none of that. There's no punishment. When the prodigals come home, we have to be ready to honor them. We have to be ready to move them right back into the gifts and privileges they had before they left. Because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. One of those prodigals comes in the door. We, <laughs> we say, you want your ministry team badge back? Today? I'm serious. The religious spirited elder son doesn't like that. Too many churches are like that, but people, that's not us. That's not where we're going. Verse 23, he says, And bring the fattened calf and kill it, 
And let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. See, we're talking real grace here. It's a grace that doesn't mean the father ignores the consequences of sin. He doesn't mitigate the consequences of sin as its own punishment, people. Why do we need to heap anything on that? He lets the son fail. Let's this son find his own bottom. I know what I'm talking about. I raised three kids. You don't know how many times I sent my wife and my mother-in-law to their rooms. I'll never forget the time. Came in the back door. One of the girls was there in the middle. My wife has lost her mind. My mother-in-law was worse. <laughs> My daughter's in the crossfire. I come in the back door and I said, Beth, sit down. Nana, go to your room. <laughs> Charity, come with me. <laughs> My mother-in-law stormed upstairs, slammed the door so hard the whole house shook. She said, well, that is just it. And my daughter is a magnificent young woman that I can be proud of. So he lets him find his own bottom. And then welcomes him home when he's reached the end. Conceals his brokenness and shame. Gives him honor. Restores his authority. <laughs> There's so much brokenness in my heart. And if you're a prodigal today, this is your home. You belong here. You're part of this family. You always were. And you are now. Come home. I have um, one other thing to say, mainly to an older generation. And I'm pleading that you don't take this as condemnation, please. Because it isn't. But it is an exhortation. And it's a confrontation of some old sin and it's a call for change and action. A whole lot of us came to Jesus during the Jesus movement from about 1969 to 1975. You know why God sent the Jesus movement? You know why that happened? I mean, do you know that the Jesus movement was the greatest movement, the greatest sweeping of thousands of people into the kingdom of God that has happened since the, in my opinion, since the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. Nothing like it has happened. You know why it happened? Because a generation of parents who understood selflessness and sacrifice cried out in desperation for their kids. And they gave their lives to their kids. It was a day when the divorce rate was 4%, people. And God responded and swept a generation of us hippies by the tens of thousands into the kingdom. Desperate prayers. They knew how to sacrifice for a cause greater than themselves. There has been no great movement sweeping young people into the kingdom since then. None. And we are looking now at a generation that is lost we had hope. They don't. We were captivated by ideals. We thought we were going to change the world. They have despair. Nathan and I listen to them every day. There's been no mass movement of God for them. You know why? Because we let them down. We did, and we're going to have to face it. We let them down. A lot of charismatic Christians, revival Christians, people that I love, they comfort themselves by looking at the International House of Prayer or the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry or the School of Ministry in Toronto, and they say, wow, isn't this a powerful generation of young people coming up? I'm telling you, that is the smallest minority. That is not the norm. We are losing a generation
church is frankly losing the war. There has been no equivalent of the Jesus movement for this generation because the older generation sank into self-absorption and compromise, abandoned its children, gave them nothing in faith, morality, or purpose, and now they are lost. They're fascinated with death, with vampires, with zombies, and with horror. Why? Because there's no hope for them. And so I have one request of you. And isn't this the craziest Easter sermon you ever heard? I have one request of you. Will you pray with me? Will you cry out with me desperately for our prodigals to come home? For a generation to be reached? Please, get out of our stuff. There have been thousands of them touched by our ministry cumulatively that have been seduced by the darkness and they're living devastated lives. I want them to come home. And when they come home, will we receive them? Will we clothe them with honor? Will we clothe them with grace? Will we be bestow authority on them? Will we fight for them? Will we do whatever it takes to reach them? Stop thinking about whether a prayer time is entertaining enough for us or whether we like the people that are there. Dear God, get over yourself. And come together and cry out in selfless passion for a lost generation of our children. And then finally, if you're a prodigal here today, young or old, and you've come home, will you let us welcome you home? Let us welcome you home, please. There's love in this house. This is your place. Ah. I'm a mess. I think I need my son's help. on the spot <laughs> can you give me seven minutes <laughs> people usually say a minute so I, uh, I've been called a lot of things in my life um, arrogant judgmental selfish and I used to fight those things and I'd say no, I'm a good guy. Now when people accuse me of that, I just go, duh. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think I'm here? I need a savior, man. <laughs> yeah. So this is, I guess, what I sh should be doing. <laughs> uh, There's a glory of God that invaded our youth group years ago. And there were days when our youth ministry was twice the size of the church. And kids would come to the Lord. And it was so awesome. And it wasn't awesome because I had a revelation of how awesome I was. It was awesome because I had a revelation of how awesome I'm not. And God said, if you want to reach young people, you go lower. I'm going to bring you down. And I'm going lower right now. And so I know God is up to something. I can hardly move because I'm convicted of my own sin. I can hardly move because I know I'm nothing. And God's going to use me anyway. I can hardly move because I am sick inside. And I need forgiveness. I need a Savior that will love me like I am. And I am no good. 
and he's loving me anyway, and that is what will... So here's what I need. If you're a young person, you're still somewhat young probably, and you were first ever touched by a glory that fell in our youth group. I'm just going to be honest with everyone here. There was a glory and a presence that fell that never came on Sunday morning, never. Never did. The kids would come on Sunday morning, there was nothing, and so they didn't want to come back. They'd go back and live on Thursday because that's where God was. But the glory, I want to talk to you guys, and Brandon and Denise, guys, I love you so much. <laughs> that, that hasn't left us, you know? The glory is still living in us right now. Mm -hmm. Never left. But what I'm going to ask is that all of you who came in and were touched by what God was doing in the youth ministry, you know, then or now, the glory that you felt, that still, is still living inside you. If you would please stand with me now. If you would stand with me now. You were touched by the glory in the youth ministry. That's when you first came to know Jesus. Yeah. Stand with me now. God is moving in this right now. Yeah. And I know the only way is for, to go lower. We got to go lower. As let me ask you guys standing here. Did you come because I yelled at you about your sin? Is that why you came? You tell me why you came. Why did you stay? Did you hear that? Say it louder. Love. That's why they came. Because I knew I was nothing. And I'm getting more revealed that I'm nothing. And what a failure I am. And it is not a bad thing. It's glory. That's where the glory is. God has convicted me so much I can hardly breathe of my own sin. And I don't, I'm not, I don't feel contempt at all. I feel his love for me. And that's where my joy is coming from, because I know I don't deserve any of this. So I'm calling all of us to go lower. And maybe the glory will be released. Maybe the glory, it's living in our hearts, guys, all of you. It's still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. The power is still there. And it's going to be, I want it to be released by us going lower, by letting him convict us. Because it's not going to be pointing out the sin. It's not. People know it's going to be us going lower, going lower, knowing that we don't deserve his love. But they deserve our love. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, can I end of So, I just want to ask, especially you guys that stood up right now, if you just pray that even you would go lower, that God would even convict us and let us go to the cross, see Jesus on Easter Sunday. I need a Savior. You know, I didn't show up because I have the answers. I showed up because I got nothing. I showed up because I got nothing to bring. All I got is my brokenness, Lord. All I got is my stuff. I don't, I don't have it. And so I come in today because I need a Savior, Jesus. I need a Savior. So let's just pray. Let's invite our, our dear Lord who loves us and is saving us and is sending us to a perfect place that we don't deserve to go because he's so good. So, Lord, Lord we call this resurrect, Resurrection Sunday. Lord, I know there can be no resurrection unless there is a death. 
bring us to the cross, God. <laughs> Just break our hearts. Let us die to all that is not you in our hearts. <laughs> that we might re be raised with you. That we might live for real. Lord, all those who carry in them that root, that seed of glory that you placed in them has been there for a long time. I ask that you would water that seed and that seed would grow and there would be glory on Sunday morning for the first time. There would be glory. There would be glory, Lord. Or people would walk in off the street again because you were so here. Or people would line up by the hundreds to get saved like they used to just to say, I want Jesus. And forgive us, Lord. <laughs> forgive us, God. We fall so short of your love. <laughs> we fall so short of your word. Lord, I fall short of your love. I'm so sorry, God. I'm so sorry. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is not a theological issue. Like, I know I'm forgiven. I hope you do, too. This is acquiring the heart of God. This is acquiring the heart. We know we're forgiven, don't we? But do you know what that actually means? Do you know what he sacrificed? Do you know his love that goes so deep? That's where it is. Make us those lovers, Lord. Make us those lovers. Send your grace, God. Give your grace, Lord. Give your grace, Lord. No, we don't. We don't take any, not one ounce of glory that we give it to you. And that you would glorify us only as we give you glory. So have mercy, Lord. Have mercy. Wash us. Wash us. Wash us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is a message that we have preached for many years and poured our hearts into. Today, it goes to another level. Today, it becomes real in us. Um, I don't know why it's rattling through my head, but it is beginning of 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said, pursue love, desire the greater gifts. He didn't say, pursue the greater gifts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He didn't say, pursue the greater gifts and desire love. A lot of the body of Christ is desiring the greater gifts and that's self. I mean, if they're pursuing the greater gifts and that's self, we desire love. And that starts right where Nathan is saying. So don't, don't bother pointing out their sin. Holy don't. Spirit does an awesome job on his own. Let him point out your sin. So you may repent and change. I don't want to be the same tomorrow that I am today. I don't want to be. I want to be different. And I want to win a generation with love, with love, to go lower, 
Love flows like water. It goes to the lowest point. Go lower. And that's where he's going to meet you. You haven't seen the dirty. You haven't seen the dirty ones that could come into this place yet. Oh. That we get to love the life. Thank you, guys. All of you. <laughs> there is no traditional ministry time today. Really, what I want to see is a bunch of old people hugging a bunch of young people. And if you need to repent to somebody, you do it. Brokenhearted. Maybe it's your own kids. You know, maybe it's somebody else, but love on somebody today. Amen.